Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Baker. I'm your host at the Addiction Recovery Channel, or ARC. I couldn't be more pleased uh, than to have our uh, distinguished guest with us today, Dr. Leon Walls. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Walls, for being with us. Thank you for having me. Dr. Walls is uh, an esteemed associate professor at the University of Vermont's College of Education and Social Services. <clears throat> he is an avid uh, advocate for racial justice in America. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by, by saying that I don't, I don't think this is going to be an easy show, but I think this is going to be an important show. And, and with that, I'd like to jump right into it. Uh, Dr. Walsh, I'd like it if you would, using um, critical race theory, I'd like you to explain what exactly is white supremacy in America? Um, so, uh, the definition that we uh, use in my course for white uh, privilege is basically benefits that, that Europeans receive um, uh, that people of color, BIPOC people do not. Uh, and that includes uh, not having to uh, deal with a lot of the stress uh, that, that people of color go through usually on a daily basis. And um, we know medically that stress builds up and, and that actually, adds to a lot of health problems. Um, white privilege is, is basically having a world, a society built for you, essentially. When you say BIPOC, just to clarify, you mean black, indigenous, and people of color. Yes, I'm sorry, yeah. acronyms, yeah. thank you. So, so those populations then are not privy to what you're calling white privilege so-called white people are privileged to white privilege, correct? Yes, absolutely. So one of, the, one of the other tenets that I understand about critical race theory is that white privilege has been sewn into the fabric of American culture by legislation and law since the beginning of the country. Is, is that true? Uh, yes, essentially. Um... Uh, basically, uh, from the beginning, uh, uh, at Jamestown in 1619, those 20-odd uh, Africans uh, were uh, brought ashore. Um, in Jamestown, uh, basically, that was when the whole idea of whiteness was, was created. Um, and that was uh, particularly to distinguish um, themselves from the, the, uh, uh, the African slaves. Uh, that they had uh, started to accumulate in, in Jamestown at that time. And I, 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 I do believe that the name of the ship was the White Lion. Is the that White true? Lion. Yes. Yes. So we're talking about, a lot of people don't know about that, but that's where it really began, 1619. Yes. That, unless I'm mistaken, that's 402 years ago. Uh, yes. And, uh, Yes, 2019 was the uh, 400th uh, centennial of that of that uh, that arrival. Yes. So essentially, what what we're dealing with today, what American culture is dealing with literally today, is the result of 402 years of behavior, beliefs, legislation, laws, and norms that have placed black people in a, in a secondary position and white people in a primary position. Yes, that was actually the whole purpose of the system of race. It was to set up just those dynamics and you, you described it very well. It was to make sure that the that white Europeans or who were defined as white. Uh, so keep in mind, not everybody, uh, the, 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 the term being white uh, has, a, has been a very fluid uh, descriptor throughout our history. But for those who were deemed white, uh, the system was set up such that um, all of the institutions, all of the benefits, all of the, all of society was, was in, in fact 
made to accommodate them. And it was not, a, it, it's not, it was not set up to be, nor is it a benign system, meaning it, it, it wasn't a system simply uh, meant to uh, give benefits to uh, one group. It did that, but it also was intended to hinder and hurt and um, basically cripple the other group, which was, which at that time were the um, uh, enslaved Africans and, and subsequently the, the descendants. It, it's it's difficult to to really it's it's emotionally and um, morally difficult uh, to look at it and and to realize the extent of what has uh, been been perpetrated. It, it's not easy. So, but it's important. So we, it's, it's of the utmost importance. I mean, there's no way to overstate its importance. Um, so what we have then is we have first slavery, then we have the abolition of slavery by the 13th Amendment, and then we have black codes and Jim Crow law. Can you can you speak about that a little bit? <clears throat> sure. Um, let's first think about what what the South was like at that time. The the whole economy was based on it uh, was an agrarian uh, uh, agrarian economy, um, and basically the those enslaved individuals were uh, basically the ones who did all of the uh, the work. After the Civil War left uh, the South pretty much in tatters. Um, then you move from that to uh, what was uh, known as uh, the period of Reconstruction. And, and prior to Reconstruction, uh, be because a lot of those uh, Southern uh, whites were very, very incensed about the fact that they no longer had uh, not only their, their, their property, which were the, uh, the, the enslaved individuals, but all of their wealth had been pretty much destroyed. Um, and so that, that period in uh, the 11, approximately 11 year period after the Civil War ended was known as Reconstruction. And, and the 13th Amendment, well, the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendment were, were amendments passed during Reconstruction. And they were designed to uh, address uh, uh, slavery and, and um, uh, 13th Amendment basically abolished slavery. Uh, the 14th Amendment uh, gave uh, uh, citizenship. Um, and I think 15th Amendment was the right to, right to vote for uh, black males. Um, black females did not get to vote for quite a while as other women uh, didn't either. Um, mm -hmm. So the, 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 the black codes, were basically extensions of, of, of slavery. Those, those Southerners wanted to try to get uh, those um, formerly enslaved people to, to control them outside of uh, owning them as, as much as possible. So the Black Codes were really designed to just um, criminalize uh, uh, those individuals. It was designed to uh, make money off of them. It was designed to uh, reduce them to just uh, the second class status that they, that they wanted to. Uh, and so uh, the third, you mentioned the 13th Amendment and it did abolish slavery, but uh, I always tell my students, uh, there was a, uh, a loophole that was written into the 13th Amendment. It says mm -hmm. all shall be, um, you know, no, no, no uh, slavery shall exist except um, in the uh, event that, that you are accused of a crime. And so that is when you saw a lot of the vagrancy laws and uh, the, the uh, uh, black code laws that which led into the Jim Crow laws after. Um, and in the Jim Crow laws, as I said, after the the northern troops had basically left the, the South. Had they grown tired of, of taking care of, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, the uh, newly uh, freed um, 
citizens. And, and, and uh, so after a while, I said, ah, you know what? I think everything looks pretty good. We can take off. And as soon as that happened, um, that was when the white Southerners uh, really just jumped right back where they left off uh, with, with, uh, with the um, Jim Crow laws. And um, it, it was just designed uh, just, again, to control and um, make sure that uh, uh, those uh, uh, Black Africans did not gain anything. And, and, and that is essentially what it, how it worked. And it did work very well. So, so the, the, the <laughs> like endemic, systemic, persistent nature of, of this injustice, you know, just kind of morphed into something a little bit more disguised. People didn't call it slavery. It was more laws and codes and codified. You're free, but not really. It was that kind of the, the gist of it. <clears throat> Sure, and and there was a there was even a period, and then a lot a lot of people don't know this. Um, there was a book written by a, 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 a man by the name of Douglas Blackman, and it was called Slavery Slavery by Another Name, and it was a period um, really uh, when the United States was starting to get really industrialized, and steel was really big, and U.S. Steel was um, you know one of the major companies, and 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 what was happening. Gradually, as I said, um, the Southerners always found a way to make money off of, of black bodies, and so during this period, there was they had created what was known as the the prison lease system. And so, what this system was was you would arrest or, or get a, a, a someone for some crime. In a lot of times, it was just standing around was a crime. And once mm -hmm. you were ensnared in, in, into that system, it, it was all, it was over. Because at that point, um, you had sheriffs um, writing uh, uh, contracts with companies like U.S. Steel to ship bodies to work in the mines. And it, 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 this happened over uh, a, a period uh, during the 40s, I, I believe. Um, and it was worse, it was even worse than slavery because in this system, the bodies didn't matter. There was mm. plenty of bodies, at least with, with um, the, the market of slavery, um, a, a, a black body was worth something, worth keeping alive and worth giving at least minimal nutrition to keep alive um, because the better condition, obviously, if you wanted to, again, sell that individual. Um, but, um, uh, it was just basically a way the, 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 the black codes were just an, again, another way in which to keep control uh, uh, over situations um, that was quickly running, get, getting out of their control. Basically, I mean, it, it's very difficult, very difficult to hear. And, um, you know, I, I went to grammar school and I went to high school and, and I went to college. And, you know, these truths, these realities of like American history are, are really neglected uh, to be taught. And um, it's very, very difficult to hear, but we have to pay attention to this. Now, you know, in one of our conversations leading up to the show, we, we talked about what, what happens when, when Black Americans really begin to make progress. And I think we saw it in the 60s you know, there were assassinations. That was the, the solution to, to Black Americans making progress. You had brought up uh, another example to me. Uh, it was Tulsa. And I think that the 100 year anniversary of Tulsa is, 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 has just passed or is, is right around now. Is that true? I think it's in May. So the 100 year anniversary is in May. Would you mind describing what, what, what was Tulsa? What is it? <clears throat> Sure. Uh, Tulsa was one of, um, when we, we talked about the Tulsa riot, Tulsa was one of many, many, many uh, race, what we refer to as race riots. Um, and mainly they were, they were riots uh, that were started by um, uh, 
the white Europeans in, in some way against something that they felt that someone either in the black community had said or done or dishonored in some way. Tulsa was, a, um, was like uh, just a lot of other cities. Um, but what, what happened in Tulsa was uh, the segregation that is a hallmark of, of, of the system of race uh, was alive and well in Tulsa. And, and there was a, a section of, of Tulsa called Greenwood. And in Greenwood was where many of the black merchants and the businesses um, thrived. They were doing well. And, and in fact, it was known as Black Wall Street at the time. Mm, yeah. um, I, I, if, if I recall it right, uh, like a lot of the, uh, the way a lot of the riots began, it just began by word of mouth. Uh, okay. Someone may have said, oh yeah, this person did this or said this or or in the case of Emmett Till, whistled at this woman. Uh, um, and uh, what you saw was what we saw in uh, January 6th. We saw mob. We saw that mom mentality getting together and saying, mm -hmm. we will take what we want. Well, what happened uh, in, in Tulsa was uh, historic in a, in a lot of ways. Um, basically, the, the, the town, uh, uh, the community of Greenwood was leveled, and what wasn't leveled was looted um, and taken and stolen. Um, and you have uh, these individuals were displaced uh, as a result. They, the unusual part of this is that you had even um, uh, airplanes dropping bombs, uh, uh, kind of homemade bombs on, on these individuals. Uh, randomly shooting uh, innocent people. Uh, uh, it, it was just an amazing and, and a horrific thing that, that occurred in, in Tulsa. So it was so it was an extreme vigilante sort of sick reaction to black people succeeding. Yes. People found an excuse to go in there and destroy their success. Hard, very, very difficult, very, very difficult to hear. My, my initial reaction, you know, on, on some gut level is that that can't be true. You know, that, that can't be true. That doesn't happen in my country. We don't do things like that. It's, it's that hard to, to face it. The first thing you, I want to do is, is deny it. It's difficult, it's very, very difficult. You know, thank you for, for sharing that with, with, with me and thank you for sharing that with our audience. Now, I want to prepare to move on to like the next segment, but what, what I'd like you to touch on, Leon, is when I was uh, like a teenager in the Bronx in 1960, 61, 62, there were a lot of demonstrations around White Castles, the White Castle hamburger place, sure. and people would... They're, they're, their cry was, Jim Crow must go. Jim Crow must go. So the Jim Crow laws like persisted like and, and still persist today in disguised forms. Can you talk a little bit just uh, briefly about like the, the Jim Crow laws that follow us into the 60s and the 70s and, 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 and today? Sure. An example, um, a, a law uh, used for voter suppression, for instance, um, going to having things like poll tax, having things like um, writing rules by which say, oh, if, if you can vote if your grandfather voted. Well, of course, their grandfather never voted, which was the, the, the this idea of of trickery and, and, and loopholes and, 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 and ways to, to skirt around, um, uh, uh, around um, uh, issues. And um, I'm sorry, I lost my chance. What was that, what was that the last thing? We, um, we were like, you, uh, you, rightfully so, Jim Crow laws, <laughs> how they morphed into sort of current, current yeah. de jure legal procedures, legal legislation. Yes. that supports the oppression and the suppression of black people. <clears throat> yes, and, and, and so you look at something, um, and, and we refer to that as, 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 as uh, structural or institutional racism. It's, people 
think that racism is some person, uh, okay, let's just take, for instance, some person yells the N word at me and, uh, and, and they, that, they, they said, that's a racist. Well, okay, so you can say that, right? But that individual has no power whatsoever over me. He can mm-hmm. yell at me and scream at me and call me names, but he has no control of me. But what mm-hmm. that individual might have behind him or her is the government that has written laws and rules and policies that, that say stuff like, okay, I'm going to um, make a, uh, uh, a, uh, a war on drugs, okay? as Reagan and Nixon did. And we saw what the war on drugs really was. It was a war on black people because basically what it did was take um, individuals and and destroyed their families. Laws like uh, three strikes you're out laws, Um, mandatory minimums or sentences uh, where someone would go to jail, you know, a life sentence for um, uh, a low level marijuana offense. Can you imagine uh, anyone in, in, in the state of Vermont uh, realizing someone can spend the rest of li- their, their life in a prison because they yeah. smoke marijuana? And, and that yeah. is a real story. So th- those were um, those types of things, um, those barriers that are sewn in, like mm-hmm. into the Constitution, the 13th Amendment. It's actually written in that this is fine with this exception. So once we create that loophole Mm -hmm. and we can exploit Mm -hmm. that loophole. And so a a lot of those Jim Crow laws, a lot of those laws that you see even right now um, that are designed not to move us forward because we know what our history is. We know um, uh, how race was established in this country. And there are individuals who uh, simply don't want to move past that. They want to keep us just like this is, even with the knowledge that the system itself is inequitable to a large population of the popu- uh, a large percentage of the population. Um, so yeah, so that's what that's what those laws are. They're just they're just called other things now. But as you as you rightly pointed out, they just morphed into uh, different ways of doing it. Uh, not as overt, o- overt anymore, because you're right. It no longer is your right. It's it's just de facto. Right. You know, and, and um, well, thank thank you for that because I, I think we need to know about that because again, that's something that's not focused on in elementary school. It's not focused on in high school. We don't talk about it. We talk about there's lots of other things to talk about while this one great wrong still exists in America. <clears throat> I have here a, a like a copy of the um, Renner, Bre- Brennan Center for Justice State Voting Rights Tracker 2021. 2021, now, there, as of March 24th, uh, legislators have introduced 361 bills with restrictive position, uh, restrictive pre- provisions in 47 states. These are all voter restriction bills. So again, it's like a, a, a like a Jim Crow tsunami is coming because of what's happening historically in America right now. <clears throat> now, I like to um, I like to just underline I found a quote in a book that I like a re- like to recommend to the audience. It's called White White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. It's it's a book that is both easy and difficult to read. It's kind of easy reading, but the content is powerful, and you you have to you have to feel it. I would recommend it to everyone. White fragility, and and she the 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 epilogue, I guess, to the book is a quote, and I like to read the quote. The quote is from Lillian Eugenia Smith who is, uh, she was a social critic of the Southern United States. She's known most prominently for her novel, Strange Fruit. Now, Strange Fruit, that title was taken up by Billie Holiday 
a jazz singer in 1939. And um, she wrote and sang a song about lynching and bodies hanging from poplar trees. And she called it Strange Fruit. Uh, I, would, I would recommend following this show that you Google Billie Holiday, Strange Fruit, and listen to the song, listen to the lyrics, and feel uh, the grief um, that should be felt over, over past uh, behavior in our country. Now, this is the quote from Lillian Smith. She says, quote, these ceremonials in honor of white supremacy performed from babyhood slip from the conscious mind down deep into muscles and become difficult to tear out, close the quote. And I think, I think that's what we're describing, Leon, that these rituals of white supremacy, we, we, I was born into it. You were born into it. Everybody is born into it. It is the environment. We're shaped by it. We're formed by it. We're informed by it. And it's, it's difficult. It's so difficult to break away from it. <clears throat> Right now, I'd like I'd like uh, to play a, a tape from a Bobby Dylan song, probably his most uh, famous poem, "Blowing in the Wind," and, and the lyrics are, "How many years can a, a mountain exist before it's washed to the sea? How many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? How many times?" Can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? The answer, my friends, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. And I think that I think that, that particular lyric is so poignant for today that on May 25th, 2019, George Floyd was murdered and for a year for a year millions of americans didn't turn their heads and they didn't pretend that they just didn't see and the outcome on april 20th of this year this week was three guilty verdicts for derek chauvin <clears throat> for the murder of george floyd so I would, I think this is an historical moment for Americans. And, 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 and Leon, I'd like you to speak to that for a moment. This idea that, that, that justice, and it, 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 it's, it's bizarre to even say it like this. Like it's this weird exception that justice prevailed. But speak to that for a minute. <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, we all, every one of us uh, who, who, who has eyes, uh, every one of us saw a man being murdered. Uh, and yet, as you said, uh, a year went by, a trial, and, and still the outcome was still in doubt. Was still in doubt if one juror, if just one juror would have uh, said, oh yeah, possible. Um, uh, we would have had uh, something uh, something different. Mm. I I think we are at a at a turning point. I I think mm. I think we've also been here before, uh, as I said. And every time we come to a point in where and when it looked as if as you as you mentioned before, when progress is going to be made, there's always been a very vicious backlash. Um, that it's occurred um, because that whole idea of this being a zero sum game that if I get something or you, if you gain something that means I lose um, mm. and, and what that is, 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 is you look at it as, as individuals as we're not together I'm this and you're that um, so yeah we might be at that point and the, the, the thing that's good is, is I, I do believe that there are enough young people who 
see things differently than say you, you, you and I, gen, uh, our generation. And I always tell, the, tell my students that yeah. um, um, my generation failed. We didn't do it. We didn't get it done. And um, it, it's kind of to you to do that. So um, to just get past this, to move forward, I'm, I'm, I, as I said, I'm very hopeful. Um, and, and this may be a, a, a significant turning point as there have been before, but this might be the time where we actually do take that significant step where, where there are enough people who are not simply not saying anything or staying silent. Uh, keep in mind, it, did, it took televising, uh, you know, dogs ripping, you know, the flesh off of people in the 60s on television and, and human beings being, um, you know, fire hose uh, uh, under tremendous, I mean, from a fire hose. Um, so it took, it, it took that long for, for many of, much of white America to, to realize that that was going on then. That was in the 60s. Um, so did it take George Floyd now for another uh, generation of, of folks to see that this has been going on for the last 400 years? I hear you. I hear you. And I'm going to I'm going to take a second here. I want to read a quote by um, uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that that speaks to a lot of what you just spoke to. Um, and I, I feel, as you do, that that my, my generation or our generation, we, we we supported incremental change. And it was white people and black people, it was all kinds of people who really got active. But we failed to um, embrace what Dr. King calls divine discontent. We, we, we thought we did enough or we got distracted with this or that or what have you. And we, we kind of relaxed. And um, I, I do believe that, you know, from my little, relatively uninformed point of view that divine discontent is probably the only thing is that's going to get it. And I'll read you the quote that I'm referring to because I think it bears directly on what you're, you're talking about. This is from Dr. King's speech at Southern uh, Methodist University on March 17th, 1966, so a long time ago. He says, in the final analysis, racial injustice must be uprooted from American society because it is morally wrong. We must solve this problem, not merely because it's politically expedient, but because it is morally compelling. He goes on later in the speech to conclude. <clears throat> he says, for all too long, we have had silent onlookers but now there must be more involved participants who solve this problem and get rid of this one huge wrong of our nation. There must be a kind of divine discontent, close the quote. And, and I, I do believe that he's speaking, he's speaking directly to us. If you look at this whole George Floyd process, it, it's only because of involved participation that it happened. The initial report that was filed by the police department had George Floyd's cause of death, medical complications following arrest. If we had turned our heads and pretended we didn't see, it would have gone away and we would have never been at this moment. There's so much, there's so much uh, legal activity. There's so much uh, journalism. There's so much, uh, education on television and in the streets and so many people talking about this, this wouldn't have happened without active participation. So my, 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 my question to you going into the, the closing part of the show, Leon, you mentioned German shepherds ripping flesh and, 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 and fire hoses and people getting their heads bashed in. I saw that and we as Americans define that as racism. So it's easy to say, I'm not a racist. But 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 not doing that 
is not enough. We have to do something. So my, my question to you, I want you to really help me with this, Leon, help me to, to work through this. What, 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 what do we do to become anti-racists? Not this neutral, I'm not a racist, but this positive, forceful, I am an anti-racist. How do we do that? Help me with that. Um, well, first you got uh, you, you have to identify that. You, uh, you have to realize, okay, so wait a minute. And I always like to use the example that uh, Dr. Beverly Tatum uses um, uh, in her book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And one of the ways she does that is she says, there are three groups of people. If you, if you imagine those conveyor belts at the airport, you know, that you, we get on and uh, we've got a long way to go to the next, instead oh, yeah. of walking, it'll take us transport. She said that, she said that you could describe uh, the active races as that person running past the uh, conveyor belt. Uh, you, he's easy to identify. He's, he's the skinhead. He's, he's yelling uh, anti-Semitic stuff. He's doing all these other things. So he's easy to identify. So that's the active, active races. And on the other end, there's the active anti-racist. That act, act, active anti-racist is also doing the same thing as uh, the uh, active racist by identifying themselves as I am not one of them. I am different. I believe in this. So you have these two different groups going this way and that way. And then you have the mass of people slowly silently riding along that, L, that, that, that conveyor belt. Yeah. And their silence gives them perhaps solace. But what they don't know is that ultimately they wind up in exactly the same place as the active races, right? So I think, yeah, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you, you change the way you think. You change the way you speak. We, we have to think of each other in different ways. And I, I tell my students, we still don't, we lack the imagination of getting rid of, of that simple, simplistic system of saying, oh, I'm black. Uh, no, I, I'm not black, actually. Uh, you're not white, actually. And all of those things have been negotiable th throughout history anyway. So um, I, 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 I I think what has to be done is people have, have to stop waking up uh, believing that just by the virtue of their skin color, they have some right that's not, that, that has been magically bestowed upon them just for that. Uh, that's what the system has taught us. It, it taught me as well as you. It, it, it's, and you, you pointed out that no, we, none of us are alive right now. We didn't construct this system, but we don't have to accept that as our future either. So, you know, we, we, we can do something to change that. Yeah, I think, I think there's a great, um, like emotional, spiritual relief in that. The idea that I didn't create this system. I was born into it. And then the following idea is, all I have to do is step up now. It's not, it's not just step up now. If I step up now and admit that I've been supporting like a, a system that has been based on white supremacy and I no longer want to do that. And, and I might stumble along and kind of try to not do that and say the wrong thing here and there. But if I'm spiritually motivated to move in the right direction, if I'm morally compelled to do something about this, and I'm committed to staying on that, then I don't, I don't, I don't have the time to feel guilty. I, I don't have the time to justify. I need to spend my time being an anti-racist because it is the morally correct thing to do. And, and I'm a person who cares about the difference between right and wrong. And I'm a person who tends to want to, to contribute and want to be active. And that's, that's enough. I don't, have to, I don't have to do it perfectly. I can learn. 
I can learn from you. You can learn from me. We can have difficult conversations and we can kind of trust that we're coming from the same place. We're not trying to hurt each other. We want to move forward. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that's probably an oversimplification. I think this is going to be a very difficult time in America. But um, I, I, for one, am, am willing to, uh, to do this and to also, you know, not, uh, Dr. King talks about uh, political expedience. Uh, and, and, and that doesn't work. It has to be morally compelling. I think there's also something that I would probably call emotional experience, where you feel bad because something wrong is happening and you do a little something and then you feel good. So now you don't do anything because you feel good. I, I think we need to get beyond that too, that, that this is more important than how it makes me feel today or tomorrow. This is more about who I am today and tomorrow and who I'm going to be today and tomorrow. Would you, would you care to comment on that, uh, Leon? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think um, you hit it uh, uh, correctly. Um, the, who, who do you, uh, who, where do we want to go? What kind of society do you want? I mean, those, those are decisions you, you can make. And, and, and the, the whole idea of um, I, I can understand, and part, 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 part of the reason that many of the conversations are difficult, quote, quote, unquote, difficult, is that once someone thinks that they, uh, if they were to admit that the history is actually real and, 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 and where we are did actually occur, it, to them, many of them think, well, that's admitting my guilt. And, and, I, and I try to say, look, no, it's not about you. It's not about you at all. This is not personal. This is about us. What do you want us to look like, right? And um, so the only, the, the only thing that, that can work is action. And guilt serves to do, to do exactly the opposite. It is, a, it is a thing that paralyzes people. And mm -hmm. once you're paralyzed it, and you don't do anything, it, it, it's just it's a waste of any moment. It, it, it's uh, it, it's not. Um, I can understand passion, and I can understand you know wanting to do things. But if if you if that doesn't actually spur you to do something, then it doesn't really mean anything. Thank you. Um, you know, I do. Uh, I, I have. I, I'm. A, I, I think you and I talked a little bit before the. Uh, as we were kind of leading up to the show about uh, cynicism, you know, that, that people of our age group, you know, we've been alive long enough, um, you know, to see things, good things, worthy things uh, begin and end. And I don't, I don't feel um, discouraged at, at this point. You know, I, 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 another uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. quote is, is the arc of the moral universe bends slowly, but it bends toward justice. And, and I, I, I just see great, I know that's an incremental view, but, but, but there's something about the maybe maybe it's been that in the the history of our culture of America, there, there's been kind of a like a preparatory period where we we've, we've had you know fits and starts and stops and lulls, but overall the society or the culture has been prepared has been being prepared for something profound. And if, if ever that time were, that, that, time, that time is, is now. And um, I, wanna, I wanna go into this period, believing, believing that. One of the other things I read recently uh, addressed that was that we can't, we can't succeed at change unless we, unless we believe in change. Absolutely. And, um, you know, can you speak to that a little bit, uh, Leon? 
Yes, and and, and I'm, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the Dr. King uh, quote because um, that has always been a motivating factor to me to, to just believe in in the inheritance of people. Ult- ultimately, we'll we'll get there. I mean, it may take a while. We'll ultimately, we'll get there. But I I think I've been lucky um, in the sense that I get to be in front of a group of very young uh, uh, students who are looking to change. They are looking yeah. for ways, how can we change? It's so different. It says, tell me, give me something that I can use to change this. So I, don't, I no longer have to convince them that something's wrong. I just need to come up ways, with ways to get them creatively thinking about how to solve the, the problem. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 discouraging at times as it, as it may be, you know, seeing things like um, uh, George Floyd and, and, and the most recent thing with uh, Dante Wright and Jacob Blake and, and endless others, Eric Garner, um, is being able to see the freshness each semester of, of, of this group of, of, of young learners who will, who, who will be the people. I mean, they will be the ones who will have to take that mantle forward. And, and I, I hear their voices, I hear the passion, and I, I see them just simply saying, I want to change this. And that gives me hope. It gives me a lot of hope. Oh, and that's, that's beautiful. And, and, what are, and the group that you deal with, you know, teachers are going out to influence our children's children who are coming up. It's a beautiful place to be. <clears throat> All right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll end it on uh, that, Leon, uh, on, on that note of, of hope for all of us. And uh, I, wanna, I, I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for being on the show and, um, and extend an invitation to you for some point in the future to, to rejoin me and we can, we can take a look at you know, where we've, where we've uh, come, okay? It was my pleasure to, uh, to be here this evening and I, I, uh, I will come back anytime you want me, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. If I could shake your hand and hug you, I would. (laughs) I would too. (laughs) All right.